A conniving, manipulative sociopath with an estimated IQ of 125 who would not think twice about murdering you if you got in her way is the last person anyone would want to have in their life. And to be involved in a love triangle with one sounds like a death sentence in itself. This was Heather Strong's situation, who in 2009 was involved with Amelia Carr and Joshua Fulgham. Carr and Fulgham had been on and off for a while when he married Strong in spite of being engaged to Carr. Fulgham and Strong had two children together, before breaking up and Fulgham resuming his relationship with Carr. But Strong was not entirely aware of whose toes she was stepping on. Fulgham was a petty, impulsive criminal who had threatened her with a shotgun before. He could be scary, but he wouldn't actually hurt her, she thought. Carr, on the other hand, was a different breed, and the unfortunate Strong could have never imagined what she had been planning for her. At the Dakota, we come out with new stories such as this one on a frequent basis, making sure that we present you with all the facts. In this video, we will be analyzing the criminal mind of Amelia Carr, as we analyze her behavior in her police interviews. Your support keeps us going, so if you enjoy our content, Make sure you leave a like and click the subscribe button. It was February 2009 when Strong disappeared. She was at work, as she had been every day, and nothing seemed out of place. Her disappearance was quiet and sudden. In fact, it could have even appeared planned. The truth of Strong's disappearance went unknown for over a month. Fulgham, Strong's ex-husband and the man who had made her fear for her life, kidnapped her that day and drove her to a storage unit which sat on Carr's property. As Carr followed inside the trailer, Strong could sense what was about to happen and tried to escape. In a desperate attempt to run out the trailer, Strong was restrained by Fulgham who hit her with a flashlight and put her in a chair which Carr then tied her to. You can only imagine the fear and desperation that Strong was feeling at that point, as Carr's cold, murderous plans started to unfold. Fulgham then forced Strong to sign a custody agreement for their children, which would effectively allow the previously committed criminal legal power over them. After signing the paper, Whilst basically being held at gunpoint, Carr proceeded to try snapping Strong's neck, an initial attempt at murder which he later confessed to in a recorded conversation with Fulgham's sister. After struggling and failing to strangle Strong, a method which Carr sustained that she viewed as humane, Carr placed a garbage bag over Heather's head whilst Fulgham held her nose and mouth shut. Strong suffocated slowly, struggling against Fulgham's weight and the tape that he had placed around her neck until her last breath. Strong's remains were found on the 19th of March 2009, buried in Carr's backyard. Fulgham was the one who led the investigators to the makeshift grave, after having been pressured and interrogated. Strong's body was beneath an overgrown space, and upon arrival, a detective on the case remarked that you knew it was a grave. You just knew. If the cold-blooded murder of Heather Strong, an innocent mother of two, sends shivers down your spine, then prepare to witness Carr's elaborate police interview, complete with multiple manipulation tactics and a wall of lies. As soon as Detective Bowie, one of the leads on the case, walks into the room that Carr is in, we can begin noticing his initial attitude towards the questioning. Hey. Hey. Tired? He asks whether she is tired upon walking in on her resting on the sofa. Carr's position is tense and defensive. She has her back towards the detective as she walks in and towers above her creating a dynamic where he is in charge. He breaks this initial tension through a friendly attitude as he starts to build rapport with Carr. 
I'm trying to make this quick as possible. Okay, I appreciate you coming up here. <laughs> you look tired too. Very tired. <laughs> appreciate you coming up here. <clears throat> Understand, you're not pressured to be here. This mm -hmm. is all voluntary. That door is only closed for privacy. It's not locked. You're more welcome to get up and walk out at any time. Okay, right here we're trying to trying to get some things together. And we're trying to sort out some some differences and get a clear understanding. As Calm mimics his friendly attitude, assimilating her tiredness with his, he repeats his statement, really drilling in the fact that Carr is being helpful. Let me just get some understanding between you and Josh. Mm -hmm. How long have you guys been knowing each other? Um, this August will be about two years. So you've known each other for about two years? Yeah. As the detective starts asking about Carr and Fulgham's relationship, her position changes from a defensive one to an open, welcoming stance. Her arms are on either side of her, mimicking the detective. She responds calmly, occasionally touching or rubbing her face as she answers questions, and even looking away. This body language betrays an inner tension within Carr as the investigation starts picking up. Tell me the relationship between you, Josh, and, and Heather. They split up. Me and him tried a relationship. And then in December, he wanted to work things out for his kid's sake, and we parted ways. And we just agreed that when she came along, we'd have some kind of civil relationship. And it's hard when you got five kids between you, between different people. How many kids do you have? Three. You got three kids? Yeah. And then she has? Two. Two, two kids. <clears throat> Explain the relationship between you and her. There wasn't really ever one. <gasps> Excuse me. Um, we had a little bit of contact over the four months because she would, when it, she felt up to it, allow him to see his kids. So we had some kind of contact, but I usually got the, I'm gonna kill you, you know, you're a bitch, you're a whore, blah, 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 because me and him had a relationship off and on for the two years, almost two years. So we pretty much maintained our distance. Okay. Have you and her ever got into it about anything? No. I've kept my distance. I mean, over the phone. But actual person to person, no. She could actually be pretty civil when we had to be. <laughs> right. When was the last time you saw her? Um, a couple days after he went to jail. Because she asked me to babysit the kids for a few hours so she could go to work. And I What? Said, she yeah. likes you to babysit the kids? And I told her I wasn't too sure about it because we had an awkward kind of relationship. And she said, well, Mackenzie really likes you and she loves you and she'd rather you babysit him. So I was there for a few hours, babysat. Where'd you babysit them at? The South Shore Fish Camp. Okay. The trailer they used to live in. Uh-huh. I'm sorry. And I was there for a few hours, babysat. She came home. And Jamie came in right home. So you hadn't seen her since. When was the last time you saw her? That night I babysat, which was the Saturday after Josh got arrested. And my son turned 7 January 8th. I so don't remember if that was a Thursday or Friday. So that Saturday had to be the 9th or the 10th. Of January? Yeah. It'd be nice to locate her. I mean, we have an 8-year-old little girl who's crying looking for her mom. Mom won't call, mom won't make contact, nothing. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's just, I have three kids who have shitty fathers who have no contact with them. And, you know, it's just, it's messed up. So, I mean, he's asked, he's gone to the, you know, asked people what he can do. He's asked people like who? Like, okay, child sports is trying to come after him. And he told them, he said, look, I don't even know where she's at. I've got the kids right now. So I guess they freezed it temporarily till everything is situated. So right now it's a mess. It is a tangled up mess. We don't know where she's at. As the detective has now built a relationship of trust, cemented by the fact that Amelia had started sharing, his questions start becoming more pointed and assertive. His stance changes, no longer reflecting Carr's relaxed position. He is now sitting up, with his knees together, his whole body pointing towards Carr. Is there something that you need to tell me? Mm-mm. I mean, she made all? contact with the landlord in the spa. How do, you, how do you know that? Because the landlord had said something to 
Josh when he was going to pick up the kid's belongings about not releasing anything without her consent. Is that, is that what Josh told you? Well, I mean, that's what I heard from him and his sister. As Carr starts trying to divert her answers away from the detective's questions, he begins interrupting her and taking control of their discussion. He also repeats one of his questions, dialing up the pressure on Carr. Okay, that again, one? that's what I said. Is that's what yeah. Josh told you? So Josh told you that Heather called the landlord. No, he didn't tell me that she called. He said that when he got home to pick up the kids, his sister said that the landlord had called and told her that Heather called and said it was okay for him to go pick up the belongings. Okay, and you believe Heather made that call? I wouldn't doubt it. I mean, why wouldn't she? You know, there's a lot of people that we're going to be talking to. Oh, I know. Okay. And if there's something you need to tell me, this is the time to tell me right now. Oh, I'm hoping you guys find her. I mean... Well, we, we, we're going to find her. Find her with your help. Because, <sighs> I mean, it'd be... With your help, we're going to find yeah. her. The detective then further pressures Carr. He repeats that they need her help and that they will certainly find Strong through Carr. A statement which would have made Carr uneasy. Okay? And I need you to understand that. I need your I help. And I'm here to help. I mean, we've got kids who need both parents. If you and know something, this is the time. This is our opportunity. Because you want to see that baby being born. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Okay? Yeah. You, know, you don't want something to bite you in the behind if you know something. <laughs> I know. Okay? Um, the relationship between you and her, I know for a for a fact that you and her at least got into an argument one time, okay? And clarify this now, because mm -hmm. I know for a fact that this happened. That when you guys got into that argument, you grabbed her by her, her hair. You remember that? Oh my goodness, are you kidding Tell me? Tell me about that. Carr tries deviating not once, but twice, when the detective suggests that she had failed to mention an incident where she had grabbed Strong by her hair, which he knows of for a fact. Who told you that because... Tell me about that. That was the night I babysat. That we... She came in and we kind of talked a little bit. And I told her I had to go. She started arguing with me about not seeing Josh. And I told her I hadn't spoken to him since we split up in December. And said she was going to try to work things out with him. And that was it. And I told her I was leaving. Trust me, if I had put my hands on Tell her... Tell me what happened by that. She would have had me in jail. Well, you put your hands on her because you grabbed a handful of her hair. So yeah. tell, tell me about that incident. I didn't grab her. We were talking and we were kind of getting into a little bit of an argument. That's when I told Jamie, can we just go? So Jamie was there too? Yeah. At this moment, it is made clear that Carr would be tougher to crack than she might have seemed. As Carr tries deviating once again, the detective begins refusing to entertain her story. You guys made a mutual agreement that nobody was going to call law enforcement. Nobody was going to do anything after you guys settled down. You need to be straight up and honest with me. Okay, I'm okay? telling you how to put my hands on her. No. She had me arrested. No, no. I'm telling you what happened. His imperative statements such as, I'm telling you, you are lying to me, are starting to challenge Carr, whose body language can now be read as defiant. As Bowie starts dialing up the pressure, Carr insists upon the tune of their previous conversation. Relaxed. I'm asking you to be straight up. You're not going to get in trouble for that, but you don't need to sit up here and, and continue to but lie I'm to not. me. You are lying to me. As he senses Carr's defiance, the detective dials down his tone, establishing that he will keep friendly as long as Carr is straight up and honest. And this is the time for that you need to be straight up and honest with me. Okay? Mm -hmm. Again, you don't need to get yourself into trouble with that baby. Oh, and I know, and I'm being honest okay? with you. If I know that little tidbit, there's a lot more that I know. As he says that there is a lot more that he knows, the dynamic of the conversation immediately shifts as Carr realizes that she doesn't have as much control over what she can or cannot say as she initially thought. There's a lot more people that I have talked to. Mm -hmm. Okay? This is your opportunity for you to be straight up with me. Some shit went sour. Okay? Clean your slate. Okay, what I'm telling you is that's the last time I saw her was because we got into that argument. You don't like her. I don't have a problem with her. I've now started... you don't. 
No, I've stepped back many now times. Now you don't. There's other people has come forward about some statements that you have made. In regards to? Some statements you have made. I'm telling you, if you want me to go down this road, it's not going to look pretty for you. Okay, but what This I'm... is the opportunity. Listen, you two guys are sleeping with the same damn man. And you can't sit up here and sit up here and tell me that, oh, you, you guys had a, a amicable relationship. Because that's never bullshit. Said we did. I you said didn't we like had... her. She didn't like you. Okay, and I agreed okay. to babysit that night. Yes, you did agree to babysit that and night. And when we got However, into it, I chose to leave. you didn't want her, you don't want her in the picture because you know that Josh would go back to her. Josh would choose her over you any day. And I've you know that for a fact. many times so that he could be with his kids. I have three other kids I've raised by myself. I Raising understand Raising a child that. by myself is not a I big can deal. Only, I can only help you if you help yourself. Okay, but what I'm trying to okay. tell you is we got into an argument and I was ready to go because I am pregnant. Why would I put my hands on someone while I'm pregnant and run the risk of getting it hurt? It happened. Did it not? As Carl refuses to let her guard down, the detective decides to open up another one, establishing that he knows enough to get Carr in a hell of a lot of trouble. Carr's position becomes more closed up as she crosses her hands and interrupts, saying, I'm tired, in an attempt to once again deviate and mimic an unbothered attitude. Why would I put my hands on someone while I'm pregnant and run the risk of getting it hurt? It happened. Did it not? No. You never got into a conversation with somebody, okay? Because I'm going to open up another one, and this is the last one I'm going I'm to open up because you're going to get yourself in a, a hell of a lot of trouble, okay? I'm tired, I am you're too. tired, and you're lying to me, okay? And you're going to get yourself into trouble. It's going to be a very, very long night, okay? You got into a conversation with someone, or you offered someone some money. Oh, my God. Oh. Obviously, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I've heard this rumor. It's a rumor? Yeah. How does it more than one person know about it? Because where we live, if you tell know, me about it, let me guess, Jason Watshaw. Tell me about it. Why? Um, why is it? Why? Why is it that I have to open something up for you to say? Oh. As the detective brings up Carr trying to pay a hitman to get rid of Strong, he sits back, opening up his body, and lets Carr's response unfold. Why is it that I have to open something up for you to say? Oh. And I'm sitting up here, and I'm asking you. I'm asking you a question. Very specific questions that I'm asking you. Okay, if there's anything else that I need to know, you need to tell me. I think that'd be one that I come up, hey, somebody just said a rumor, or this bullshit rumor's going on, or this is going on, or that's happening. You're gonna walk yourself into some shit that you can't get out of. I'm telling you right now, this is your opportunity, and I only knock once. She dismisses the detective's claim as a rumor, point at which we can see the detective rise into his seat and start dialing up the pressure again. Okay, well, what I'm telling you is, me and her got into it, and I asked to leave. Well, after that, there were rumors from Jamie, Jason, that I was supposedly trying to pay someone to get rid of her, this and that. I'm not going to stoop to that kind of a level over a man. I'm sorry. It's not worth it. I have three kids I've raised by myself. This is another one I can raise by myself. I wouldn't do that. And they have done nothing but made my life hell for as long as I can remember. Jamie Aikum, Jason Lawshaw, those are two people who for as long as I can remember have made my life hell. Okay. Me and Jamie don't get along because he knows I'm in the process of trying to come after him for child support. So right now, anything he can do to harm me, he has tried. Carl's specific phrase, okay, but what I'm telling you is, shows her trying to dismiss the detective's threats as unimportant, posing as unaffected. What it does instead is show nervousness and an inability to respond to what she is being asked. Two factors which suggest that Carr is lying. What, who else do you have issues with that you, that you think that would just rely on you? Um, anyone associated with Jamie Aikam's family. Give me a name. Oh, uh, his brother Josh. His brother Josh, his girlfriend Chrissy. Um, her brother Timmy. Anyone associated with him and You're going to name family. everybody that's going to come up here and lie on you. No, I'm just naming people that are okay. associated with well, Jamie. I'm telling you, okay, someone was present the day that you had it, and you just named two people. 
that was present in a vehicle with you when you offered someone five hundred dollars where would I have to help I, sorry go ahead to help you get rid of Heather there's another conversation you have with someone you're soliciting to commit murder How? that's serious and I got more than one person telling me that okay listen to me I got more than one person telling me that okay that don't look good for you Interestingly, Carr also starts upping her manipulation tactics, asking the detective why would she hurt Strong in an attempt to find out just how much he knows already. But why would I hurt her is what I don't understand. Why? Because you can get her out of the way. But you know what? In two years, me and him have been off and on, off and on. And you're tired of that shit. But now you have a kid from him, from Josh. You okay. have no other kids from Josh, do you? I've been off and on with Jamie for ten years. Ten years. Oh, I, I wouldn't. Let me tell you something. You, so you telling me you telling me the conversation with Christy never happened? With who, Chrissy? Mm -hmm. I never said anything to her. I mean, I was mad, you... and I told her that I was pissed off about the whole situation. Exactly. You never had a conversation with Christy to help you. No, not Chrissy. And you, ne never you never had, had a conversation with um, not Josh, um, the other guy you just Jason. Met. Jason. I'm not no. I don't associate with them. So why would they tell? Why would that come up? Because of Jamie. If you knew two separate people, not two separate people associated with Jamie. And everybody hates you. If you only knew. So you're saying that you never grabbed a knife? No, I never grabbed a knife. You never grabbed never... a handful of her hair? No, because There's she would have beat my butt. Trust me, I'm pregnant. She didn't want me having his kids. She would have hurt me. Sit tight and think about this, okay? Okay. Josh is in another room, by the way. Okay. As Carr refuses to cooperate, the detective takes a break, letting Carr know that Josh, her partner in crime, is in the room next to her. He says this is an attempt to intimidate her, hoping that the knowledge that her lies can be immediately refuted by Josh would reduce her defensiveness. I'm telling you, he told me that you told him that. Okay. We know that he brought her back to the house that night. To what house? I was home. I was home that night. Listen. The detective proceeds to tell Carr that he knows she has told Fulgum that she will get rid of Strong, complete with an audio recording. Your heart is about to jump out of your chest. Because I was home at my mom's. Your heart is about to jump out of your chest. That pisses me off. Okay. Don't do this to yourself. But what? Don't okay. do this to yourself. After he says this and continues to pressure Carr, Carr starts losing her train of thought and begins to stall. Ask my mom. I was home. Don't do that this to night. yourself. What is he saying? I did it. That you set it up. Set what up though? I mean, because all I heard him say was that I didn't even hear him say where he left her at what house. No, 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 no. Listen See, to. Listen, listen here. Okay, you're trying to backpedal out of it. No, I'm trying. I didn't really hear. Okay. I'm telling you that he said that you told him that you guys took care of Heather and for him not to worry about her anymore. Once again, asking the detective questions in order to see where she actually stands. Her uncertainty as to how she is being perceived by the detective can be seen in her body language. Her gestures become grander as her anxiety increases. Who's you guys? You. But how if I you. was home? He knows, and he told me about the incident about you grabbing Heather at the house when you were supposed to be babysitting and put the knife to her throat. He was in jail. Exactly. Okay. Because he even told but me about it. He knows about it. Because he said okay? that's what Listen, let's, let's not entertain that. Let's not entertain that. Because I'm telling you right now, he's admitted to his stuff. He lowered it up, but he, he chose, you know what? I think I need to tell you all the truth. That's why you're back in here. This is the moment Carr realizes that she is being treated as a suspect. Okay, but what I'm trying to tell you is, you can question my mom, my sister, you can even question Penny Salveo, because she was at my mom's house that night. As Carr suddenly becomes agitated, we once again see the detective decompress and sit back in his chair. 
Car sits up and tenses as she tries to dig herself out. What night? It's February 15th, the day after Valentine's Day. That supposedly she left. The day after Valentine's Day, February 15th, because they came over there. Let me explain something to you, sweetheart. Okay? Just explain to you earlier when you were here, in here today mm -hmm. that you had been soliciting people to do something to her. Hearsay. Carl lets hearsay slip, pushing the detective as she begins her offense by pleading not guilty in her own mock trial and supporting it with whatever evidence she can think of. You call it what you want. <laughs> I'm just... You call it what you want, lawyer. Okay? We ain't back down here to have a picnic. I know this, but see, okay? this is why I'm upset is because... You can be upset all you want to. I'm telling you right now, your boyfriend has thrown you on, on, under the bus. He's admitted to lying. He's admitted, okay, that he is involved in this and knows about it, okay? Mm -hmm. And that you know about it. Now, you can sit here and play this game all you want. I told you the first time when I held your hand and I looked you square in the eye and I told you this is your opportunity to come clean and be straight. Okay, but what I'm trying to tell you is... I'm going to get up and walk out of this room if you lie to me. I you was, ain't back down here for nothing. I know this. I was home. Okay. Is it, you can is listen it? to every jail phone call okay. back and forth between me and him where he has hinted at when I get out, things are going to be different between me and you. You don't have to worry about her messing with us anymore. Did he but, give you $1,000? From where? I put up 1700 for his lawyer so he could get out of jail. Mm -hmm. I put up 1700 Mm-hmm. Where was he going to give me a thousand dollars? Paid your money back, didn't he? No, he didn't. When he got when he got his tax? No, he didn't. He didn't give you a thousand dollars? Because his taxes went straight to his lawyer because mm -hmm. he had to sign a waiver so she could cash the check. Okay. And when he got a check for a thousand dollars, he asked me whether or not we wanted to try to work things out and live together. So or he never told you that. I'm sorry. So you never it's told okay. you never told him to not to worry about her anymore. He's no. taken care of. If you listen to the jail call, we're not talking about jail oh, phone calls. Well, he, he was out of jail then. He was out of jail. No, I didn't, and I was home because you can question my mom, my sister. You can question Penny Salvale and her son because they were at my house that night because Josh was calling from so his mom's cell phone. So he's a flat out liar. If he's trying to involve you in, in her death, yeah, and you know that's got me really upset right now because I have kids I have to take care of. I've done it on my own. Why am I going to risk throwing my life away over someone who we were just screwing around off and on for two years? She continuously brings up her children, emphasizing her position as a victim of Folgum's instead of a possible offender. In a different room, Folgum is reaching his breaking point, quite literally cornered by two detectives. Yeah, I live now. I don't know what else to tell you. I don't know where she's at, man. I don't. I just want to sleep and so you, get up. So you're telling me Amelia knows, she knows everything? I say she knows more about the shit than I do. You're telling me she never asked you, if she was going to do it, she never asked you what was the best way to do it? She never asked you where's the best place to finish? Man, I ain't no fucking murderer, man. I don't know what the best way to kill people and get rid of them and shit. Folgum's bodily movements indicate desperation and anxiety. His attitude contrasts Carr's composure, an aspect which might raise the detective's eyebrows. If she can maintain this calm when she is being pressured, what other things could she do in this same indifferent, methodical manner? At this point in the investigation, Folgum takes the detective to Carr's backyard, where Strong had been buried. He tells them that Carr had killed her. What we want you to do is listen to us right now, okay? Don't say anything. Obviously, you know what's going on. You have been in here since last night, answering questions, telling us lies, telling us the truth, telling us lies back and forth, okay? That stops here, okay? We found Heather, okay? She's obviously murdered, okay? 
we've been speaking with Josh all night, okay? We've been listening, letting you listen to some of the things he's been saying, and we've been telling him some of the things you've been saying, okay? That's not an attempt to play you one against the other. It's an attempt to get the truth out of two people that are lying to us very much, okay? I want to tell you how you stand right now, okay? You don't stand so well, okay? Because everything is pointing to Amelia, and I'm going to explain that to you, and I want you to listen to me and not ask, ask any questions, okay? Um, what I've done is just made a little cheat sheet here for myself, okay? We have Amelia, that's you in the middle, okay? And these are all the things that are against Amelia, okay? The body was found on your property, okay, where you're living. As officers reveal to Carr that Strong had been found in her backyard, he can see that she has reinitiated her first position on the sofa, the one she had started with in her interrogation. This might reflect a state of anxiety in Carr, as well as a need to comfort herself as she is slumped over, resting her head on her arms and with her legs crossed. Um, we have Heather, okay, obviously she's deceased. Um, but Josh was going to go back with her, the father of your baby, okay. We have Chrissy and we have James involved, okay. Chrissy's like, yeah, you know, she held a knife to her throat, pulled her hair and all that stuff. Don't deny it, don't admit it, okay, because I don't want to lie out of your mouth, okay. But I still have everything pointing to you. Yeah. I can put you in prison for the rest of your life just with this evidence, okay. I can. But... I need to give Amelia a chance because you've been lying to us all night. You've been telling us the truth here. You've been telling us lies there. Okay, that stops right now because Amelia and her baby are being affected now. Yeah, and I've been trying to make an effort with Detective Bowie with the phone calls. Okay, you're being affected now. Okay, because you don't want your baby born in prison. We don't want your baby born in prison. Prison. Okay. Um, and I'm not saying that's where you're going to end up, okay? Um, but if I have to use all this stuff against you, you're the only suspect that I have right now that, that can win in court, okay? So I want to know from you exactly what happened. No more of this I think or I heard or nothing. I want the truth, okay? The truth starts right now because now we ain't playing, okay? You never met me before. You have to trust me, okay? You have to trust this man too. He's been doing this a lot longer than I have. He's been doing it 30 years, I've been doing it 20 years, okay? It stops today. I don't want to go to prison. Uh, well, let's... We don't want you to either, okay? I don't know what I can hand you, Josh, on the silver platter. As she says this, a voice change can be noticed. Her tone changes from a submissive one to one that is assertive, cold, and the officers can sense that she has switched. Okay, well, let's get through this, okay? And, um, keep your kids in your mind and in your That's mother. what I'm saying. I mean, I can tell you everything that I know. Okay. Are you willing to do that? I don't want to. I want immunity. I will testify. I will... Let's do. hear what you have to say, brother. I can't promise you nothing. Yeah, well, see, that's what well, I'm Well, let me, let me just explain this to you. I just, I want something to where I'm not going to take you from my babies. Well, we ain't going to take you from your babies, and we're not going to take your babies from you, okay? Um, See, it, it's, it's hard because we, we're trying to understand, I I'm trying to understand what, you, what you're going to tell me, okay? A lot of what you can tell me, we're going to know if it's the truth or not, okay? Yeah. I, I don't think that... Uh, I hope that you don't think that you would be sitting here having this conversation with us if we wasn't thinking anything different, okay? Yeah. All we're after is the truth. I okay? understand that. Just the truth of who killed her, okay? Well, I didn't kill her, but I can tell you details and I can tell you things okay. about I, I, I everything. Bet, I bet you can, okay? But I'm just saying. If you didn't kill her, okay, and you tell us and we believe you, okay, we can't put you in jail for something you did. Well, after Detective Bowie played me that tape, that's when I told him when we go out to the house, every time he calls, I want it on speaker, and I want you to hear what he has to say. 
and I've been asking him the questions Detective Bowie wanted me to ask him. I'm trying to help. I just, I don't want to be taken from my kids. Okay. I mean, I can tell you details that you guys probably already know. I can tell you everything that happened to her. As it becomes increasingly clear to Carr that she cannot keep lying, she instead becomes cooperative. Everything from her stance, which is now open with her arms spread out, to her offering answers, indicates that she is reaching a level of pressure that she was not feeling earlier in the interrogation. I come across Heather. Where? Duct taped to the little blue chair. In the, tra in the trailer? In the trailer. And I freak out. I check for a pulse. I'm looking to see if she's breathing. And I'm just checking. And I walked out. And he was there later that afternoon. I asked him, what the hell did you do? He told me that in the middle of the night, after we were in bed, he brought her there. And I guess he told her that he knew where I had money stashed to get her to go back there. And that he basically... He hit her upside the head with something, and she was trying to leave, and she broke the window, and he left her there because he didn't know what to do with her, how to dispose of her. And I told him, I want nothing to do with this. Get her the hell off my mom's property. Okay, this is on your mom's property? Yes. Okay. And this is Monday morning? No, this is Monday afternoon when he got off work that he came out there that he had asked my mom for a shovel because he told her he had a dog. And I told him I wanted nothing to do with it, and I walked out, and I told him, if you don't do something, I'm going to call the cops. And what he did after that, I don't know. When you checked her pulse, did it you was find nothing. Pulse? She was cold. Was she sitting in a chair? She was duct taped to, to a chair. chair. What color chair? It's the only one in that little kitchen area. It's a okay. little blue chair. Okay. And I told him, I said, you got to do something. I said, I don't want this crap here. I said, Josh, I don't know what the hell's gotten into you, but you need to do something. And he asked my mom for a shovel. What he did, I didn't think he would bury her on my mother's property. Carr is now building a narrative around the murder, placing Josh as the killer and herself as a collateral victim and witness. I mean, that's just sick. I mean, it's bad enough what he had done, but to do that and make it look the way it's looking now is just not okay. Mm -hmm. And he told me, if you tell anybody, I'll make sure you go down with me and you'll be right next to her. Right next to her. Okay. Uh, so why didn't you tell us the truth at the mm -hmm. beginning? Why didn't you tell because us? Because I was scared. You were scared? I mean, like I told you, I have kids. I mean, I've seen people go to prison for knowing stuff. As she continues with her story, Carl's tone of voice becomes emotive. However, her position on the sofa, as well as her arms, still spread out and offering information, indicate that she believes she is regaining control. I think it's time for we open Pandora's box, at least from our end. And you need to do it all on the record. Today, you had a conversation with Josh's sister. That conversation was recorded totally. You, out of your own mouth, admitted to being there. You used, you used some of the words that I just used. I waited in the house for a few minutes, just like I was told. There was a recorder in her car. There was a microphone in her car so we could listen to you. We didn't just stumble across that car sitting in the park. Yeah, no. Okay? We heard everything. Now, let's go back to what I was just saying. You have shown no remorse. I'm not trying to be mean, but quite frankly so far, you have shown that you're acting like a cold-hearted, hateful person who killed the mother of two children. Okay? I don't cry? No, because you sit right here stone cold and stare in that man's face and lie to his face. This interview, which happened after the police had evidence of Amelia assisting in the killing of Strong, is markedly different from the first. Firstly, Carr is sat in the corner of the room with officers on either side of her, a physical element which is bound to cause her some anxiety. 
However, her foot is resting on one of the detective's chairs, indicating that at that point Carl was relaxed. Unbeknownst to her, she had been caught out. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. You remember those words? They came from whose mouth? Um. Let's start over. And I'm going to quit talking. I, I don't have anything more to say. Tell me what happened. I did when I was told you. Tell me what happened. What does it going to do with the second boy? Tell me what happened. I want to hear from you. Get that burden off your back. Tell me what happened. You've already admitted to it. You've gotten over that hurdle. You have admitted to killing someone. No, I admitted to it. Attempted, and they were He killed her. As Carl's cover is blown by the detectives, she maintains her cool on the surface, but this small blip, where the officer has to ask her a question twice, suggests that beyond the surface, her mind is racing. Get that burden off your back. Tell me what happened. You've already admitted to it. You've gotten over that hurdle. You have admitted to killing someone. No, I admitted to it. Attempted, and they were He killed her. Similarly to Carr's earlier mention that what she was being accused of is hearsay, she now claims that all she had admitted to in the recording was attempted murder, and not the successful killing of Strong. She is still resisting, in spite of the evidence piling up against her, and she had done her research. As the detective leans in, cornering Carr with his question, she refuses to meet his eye, covering her face with her hand, and not allowing the detectives to see her at that moment. She is now vulnerable, and she cannot hide it anymore. As much as Josh has told us, which is a lot, he still says that you were the one who killed her. I killed her. Okay. I wasn't there. I don't know. I can tell through our investigation and all the people we've talked to, and all sifting through every single lie. Josh has thrown plenty of them up there. You've thrown plenty of them up there. I know you were there, okay? I don't know who killed her at that moment that she died, but I do know y'all were both standing in that room. Is that right? Then if you have something to say that's not the same as what Josh said, Excuse me. now's the time. Don't give, give us that respect. Don't nod. Is that right? We have it on tape. Is that right? I'm not talking to you in sign language. I know. I'm talking to you person to person, respectively. I don't want to assume that you nodded your head, but is that right that you were there with Josh when Heather took her last breath? Yes. I can't hear you. Yes. What did you guys do after she took her last breath? Can I ask you something? Can you answer if that I for me? Stop Can you answer that? Questions. You're just gonna go ahead and arrest me, right? There's no way I'm going home tonight. You you keep looking at, at what you're sitting in here doing and you keep thinking that this is what's getting you in trouble. No, okay. What's getting you in trouble is the night of February fifteenth. Okay? This is why this all started. From here on out, you've got a decision to make. You can, you can still play these games and still try to weasel out of whatever you, you think you can weasel out of, or you can take the right path. And the right path is sitting in here saying, you know what? I did something. I did something wrong. If I had the chance to take it back, I would, but I can't. So you know what? Here's what happened. I apologize. If I could take it back, I would. I'm sorry. So far, the only thing you've done here is try to save your own behind, even though you killed a woman. I didn't kill her. 
Yes, you did. Then tell me what happened. Because Josh so says, it. you did it. After you tried to break her neck and couldn't do it, you killed her. I did not kill her. For, show, show me something different then. Because Josh has been telling us the truth for several days. I did not kill her. After weeks of investigation and police interviews, Amelia finally comes clean about what happened. The problem is, is she telling the truth? He wasn't himself to take a bullet. He was not. You were not either. I was scared shitless. Was anyone stopping you from running out that door? Fear? Was anyone stopping you from running out that door? Fear, but I guess that doesn't count, huh? No, it does not, sweetheart. I'm sorry. One of you is still lying about some of this, but only you or him knows which one is. That's why I've been asking you from the beginning to tell me the truth. That way, when Amelia opened her mouth and said, I have something to say, we both perk up and said, well, if Amelia's saying it, she's the one that's truthful, we have to believe her. At this point... Do you not see why I'd be scared to tell you the truth? There's no need to be afraid of Josh. Josh has never beaten you. Josh has no history of beating you. No, and Josh is until, in jail right now. But until that night, do you not see why after that night I would be scared to go against him? Okay, but Josh told us that y'all had talked about doing something We've like this. We've never talked about anything he said like had, this. Y'all have never planned it fully. Fear is not an issue with you. What do you mean? Fear has never been an issue with you. You have never been afraid of Josh before or after you guys took someone's life. Afraid he might leave you. No, I wasn't afraid of him leaving me because I left him. I left him. Do you understand me? Fear was not an issue. I was afraid to go against him. Uh, you just told me that you tried to break her neck. Because that, he that's told attempted me to. murder. That's what you told me. Is that is that not what you told me? Yes. What I did was attempted murder. Correct? Because he told me to. But that's what you, that, is that not what you said? I tried to break your neck, but I couldn't. You don't think you deserve that? No, because I didn't kill her. <clears throat> I really didn't. So, so he calls you, <sighs> whether, you, whether you think he was joking or not, he calls you and says, I'm on the way there wait till we're in there a couple minutes and come back and you know exactly what that means you know exactly what it's going to lead to and you made no attempt to stop him talk him out of it or call the police Carr once again tries to employ her earlier tactic of implying answers but the detectives do not fall for it particularly since fulgham had never been violent towards Carr. you went out there she tries to get away she's trying to escape because she sees what's coming She's struggling, and you help him imprison her, see. keep her. You, you, you help him do all the things that he needs to do, knowing what's about to happen. He asks you to kill her, and whether you tried real hard or whether you didn't try real hard, you make an attempt so that, she, so that it will be quick and painless and she can be put out of her misery. And when you're unable to do it, whether you were not strong enough or whether you didn't have the willpower, you step away so that he can take his turn. You watch it happen. At no time have you told us that you tried to stop him. You tried to talk him out of it. You tried to say, you know what? There was no... If you were there, Detective Spock. I wasn't there. If you had been there. You were. There was no... There was There no, was time before he got there. You could have picked up the phone and said, I honestly Josh, didn't think he was coming. Let's, let's not do this. This isn't a good idea. Once again... As the detectives begin retracing the events of February 15th, Carr refuses to look at them, suggesting dishonesty. You could have said, uh, Sheriff's Department, I think I've gotten in deep, but I'm trying to do the right thing. I don't want this girl to lose her life. I don't want these children to lose their mother. There was and, and all these things I'm saying to you, you help put her underneath the table for a day, maybe two days. I didn't help do any of that. You, I just knew that he did it. You, you come mm -hmm. outside to see if the hole's deep enough that he's about to bury her in. You you watch her being buried. You help cover I her up. I didn't watch. I went back inside. Did you jump in the hole? No. On top of her? No, that's sick. Okay. So all these things. and what, what do you think that you are guilty of then? I know what I'm guilty of. What do, you, what do you think it would be appropriate? 
But I just wish that you would take into consideration. But I was fucking scared. Tell me what you think you're guilty of. Of being a monster. I'm sorry. Of being a monster. And helping a monster. Of I, I didn't understand. <laughs> helping a monster. Oh, helping a monster. Do you want anything to drink? Do you need to use the restroom? Are you okay? No. Are you hurting? I guess I should ask that because I know that you're not okay. Are you physically okay? Huh? How long before you guys take me over to be booked? We're, we're going to do the paperwork right now. Carr's gestures now resemble the ones we previously saw in Folgham when he was being cornered and interrogated. They are getting grander and more aggressive, indicating an interior struggle as well as anxiety. Carr was arrested after her interviews and originally sentenced to death in 2011. She was on death row for six years before being re-sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole in 2017. Folgham was similarly sentenced to life in prison in 2012. Beyond Carr's artifice and claims to innocence, which are still ongoing to this day, lies the sad truth of Heather Strong's demise. A young mother of two and a hard worker, Strong's fate is one that no one deserves. Do you think justice has been served? At the Decoder, we analyze the most intriguing crimes and mysteries. We compile all the sources we can find in order to provide you with what we believe is the hard truth. Did this video pique your interest? If yes, then make sure to give us a like and a follow, and we will see you next time on The Decoder.